everyone and welcome. My name is Lexi LeBan. I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Film Institute and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's screening of The Glorias, Julie Taymor's newest film about the many facets of Gloria Steinem's life, life's work, and community. I'd like to uh, mention that this film is part of a series called The Story She Tells series. This is JFI's two-year initiative that shines a spotlight on Jewish women in front of and behind the lens in television, independent film, and Hollywood. I'd like to thank the sponsors of the series, Propel, for making sure that we can bring these very important screenings to you. I'm also honored to be partnering with Roadside Attractions, Roadside has specifically uh, designed this outreach campaign to coincide with Inaugural Week. JFI is really excited to do our part in making sure that this very important film and the conversation and action it inspires is seen. We really hope that if you enjoy today's screening and conversation, that you'll let younger audiences know about it, especially. Um, because they may, may not know the very important history um, depicted in the film. We've invited a very special guest interviewer to speak with Julie Tamor following the film. Laura Thielen is the former program director of the San Francisco Film Society, now SF Film. She lives in Colorado, where she served as the executive and artistic director of Aspen Film, for 20 years. She's spending her pandemic life doing the things she loves, getting outdoors safely, uh, reading and writing, and interviewing the filmmakers that inspire her the most. So uh, please welcome Laura Thielen to introduce today's screening. Welcome back. And thank you for joining us for this Jewish Film Institute presentation of The Glorias. And I'm, very, I'm Laura Thielen, and I'm incredibly pleased to have an opportunity to have a conversation with the director, Julie Taymor. Just a little background on Julie. I'm sure you know her films, uh, her stage productions, her operas well. But in case you're new, um, she's an Oscar-nominated and Tony Award-winning director of theater productions, opera, and movies. Uh, she was the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant. She has made several films, um, including adaptations of Shakespeare's The Tempest and Titus, which I believe, Julie, was your first film. Um, and I'm sure you are all very familiar with her films, Frida and Across the Universe. Julie, it's a pleasure to welcome you this morning. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my first, so we have about, we have a little while to talk and there's so many things to ask you about this deep and rich film. What I'd really like to start with is um, th the appeal and the challenge of adapting Gloria Steinem's memoir, those are evident. I was wondering if you could talk about what about the project personally resonated you? Like, what was it that really compelled you to want to tell this, this particular story? Well, I, I was given the book by a friend, My Life on the Road, and just to read on a beach about five years ago. And I, I wasn't thinking of looking to do, first of all, a biopic, because that's not something I, I really like doing, even though I did Frida. Um, I, I wasn't thinking of it as a movie. And especially because it's not written like it could be adapted into a movie. It's, it's not narrative in, or dramatic in a normal three-part storytelling way. So it was anything but a movie in, in the book. It was a road book. Now, road movies are, there are plenty. And as far as female road movies, road movies, very few. Like the only one I really know is Thelma and Louise and look how that ends right? <laughs> um, oh, I did that very Gloria, right? <laughs> she always says right at the end of things. Uh, but I, I had known Gloria superficially, but I knew her. My, my mother is a big political, or was, she's 99 now, and in Massachusetts, and my sister as well. So it's in the family, activism, 
democratic politics, running for office, women's issues, but I had not delved into it myself. And I knew Gloria in New York City, and I was shocked to go back and read, especially her childhood. Mm. How did she become an activist? How did she find a voice? She wanted to be a dancer. She was, you know, she wasn't very good, but she still loved it and she still dances. And, and uh, I was so taken with the, with the fact also that these stories of women of the second wave of feminism, the women in the 60s and 70s, and the mixture of women of color with white women, which I think is misunderstood still or, or ignored. You know, it's, it's um, especially now, not all, and there were plenty, but I know that in Gloria Steinem's life, her relationships with Wilma Mankiller, Dolores Huerta, Flo Kennedy, um, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, and then the various unknown black women who entered her life from a very young age, this is what made her the woman that she is. So there was that part of it. I found the taxi rides in the book very interesting. And then I didn't really do more, most of them because it was just too time consuming for a film. It would take too long. I mean, too long on screen. But I, I thought that the era, 80 years of this woman's life and how many heroes do we have in America? Seriously. So I felt um, not that I was looking to do it, but that it was looking at me and saying, can you do me in a way? It was, it said, I think that I've, I think I could find a way. And when I told Gloria that I wanted to do it, she thought I was nuts, you know, she, she, she didn't get it at all. I mean, she was excited because she knows my work or had seen and, and was, you know, very enthusiastic, but she didn't, I didn't either, frankly, until I figured out the bus out of time, knew how I would really pull it together. Well, I love what, one of the things that really struck me about the film is the importance of voice. Um, finding a voice, expressing a voice um, individually and also collectively, and also the importance of listening. That's the one for me. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk, uh, because what I did, what, of the many things that I so admire about the film, it was that intersection of different voices and different communities. And I was wondering, and, and I appreciate that you remind us of that. So I was just wondering if you could talk about what resonated with you about voice and, and listening. Well, I, I began it in the first statement, which is, uh, I, I think that listening is her greatest asset, even though people know her as a speaker and as an editor of Ms. Magazine and many, and as a writer, I really think her um, encouragement, but also her ability to take it all in from all people. I mean, this is even right at the beginning, the first scene in the um, diner out in Sturgis. I mean, it, it's it, it, how many things are so, oh my God, I can't believe this is going on in Sturgis this year. You know, we were shooting that, but judging a book by its cover, her, you know, her ability to, look at people and then look deeper behind the surface of people. That's in the first scene. But then what's really clear is in all of her journeys and especially starting in India, the idea of the talking circle really gained its first voice to her as, a, as, a, as an activist when she was brought into those talking circles in the villages during caste riots. And she saw what that did for community, the grassroots nature of letting other people, listening to other people tell their stories and how, um, how that really binds people. And I think Stacey Abrams has really found that this year. You know, I think that kind of going out and not yelling with megaphones on, you know, televisions and all, but really grassroots organizing. And when, when the young Gloria, the, the Alicia Vikander sits in that train, which is one of my favorite scenes because I went, like Gloria, I went to Indonesia for four years. I went for one year and stayed four when I was exactly the same age, 21, 22, had graduated from Oberlin and traveled as well in third class trains in, in, in Java. I, I had this, that experience. So that was real for me, sitting there, listening to these women speaking languages I didn't know but having them touch my arms and, you know, ooh, I had hair on my arm, you know, the whole skin thing, but really watching and listening. And when those women ask her in the Indian train sequence, 
why she's not traveling in a car like all the other Americans, she said, well, then I really wouldn't be in India, would I? And I wouldn't have met you. Now, I, I find that to be the heart of it. You know, if you want to be in America, you have to be in America. And Gloria has no fear going anywhere across any racial boundaries, clearly gender. She found her way to deal with men in a very unaggressive way, which is fascinating. It's probably a, the time period has a lot to do with that, but men loved her, all kinds of men. I mean, even the New York Times editor, of course, when she puts his letters down and, and leaves, I'm sure he's just like utterly shocked, but she, she does it in a way that says, I don't need this. I'm just going to walk out. And I think for this day and age, you know, we've had to have, and it's necessary, the Me Too movement, but women who prior to that, who were strong and were assaulted or were that lines were stepped over, she found her way to do it. And I, I find that very inspiring. There's so many little things about Gloria and her life that are, you know, astounding for us now to go back and see how these women, these black women, I mean, look at Flo Kennedy, how she was able to deal with the audiences attacking her for being a lesbian or for being this or for being that, she found humor. And that's another thing that I thought was great for the movie. Gloria has the most incredible sense of humor. So that's always good because the, the trouble with getting movies like the Gloria's out is people think it's medicine. They think, oh God, feminism, ugh. oh, we have to listen to this story. And you know, it should be fun. And it was very important to me. I was moved and really to tears, the story of her mother and the story of how her father, when he died, she didn't show up at the hospital. I mean, one friend of mine in Italy who just saw it, uh, sent a link, it's not there, uh, said uh, that, that when she's with the doctor who chastises her for not being there for her father's um, illness, he said that was his favorite scene. And I thought, that's interesting. There must be some personal thing that made that his favorite scene. But I, I have found that everybody likes different things in the movie and not everybody likes everything, but they like different. Some people would rather just Miz and onwards. A lot of people say, I like the childhood because that's what made her and we didn't know that, you know, so. Well, I, I really like, I was fascinated that you start, well, there's many things, but that you have four Glorias and you start with the child, her childhood. And when I was watching it, I was like, so why are we getting this information? But then the way that the story unfolds and the way you put it together, it really, it shows how much, because Gloria Steinem is so iconic, she's so glamorous. And, and, and so th that, that when we see where she comes from, it really grounds her in an American reality that, I, th that explains why she's able to move through different communities with, with, with such ease. And I'm sure it's something that she learned. I, I wanted to ask you just briefly because you touched on it, the South Dakota scene at the big, that where you open the film, mm -hmm. is that a composite of different things or did that actual events happen to Gloria? That happened, that's the first scene in her book. Okay, it, yeah, it's, because it, I... it's, it, 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 it's not a composite at all. That's why I put it in. I mean, I, it made me laugh right away at the top of the book. You know, she describes the terror of being in that, that, that you know, with hundreds, we only had a small amount, but hundreds of bikers for that Sturgis thing and the, and the feeling of, oh my God. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic as those, those two middle-aged uh, bikers tell how their lives change because of Ms. Magazine. I found it hard to believe, but I believe everything in her book. The other one that I absolutely did not cut at all was the woman in the March on Washington, the African-American woman who describes Fannie Lou Hamer and where are the women. And the reason this meant so much to me, because I got a lot of people saying, why don't you clip it? Why don't you, it's too long, it's too long. You know what? Sometimes the very full length of a story is its, it, is its power that there's a point where Gloria Steinem at that young age, whatever she was in 1963, just sat there listening to a woman and watching her go to her delegate leader, that the black woman go over there and say, why aren't there any women speakers? Singing ain't speaking. And I had done the March on Washington as a, as a very powerful moment 
and the death of Martin Luther King as well in Across the Universe. And I had used black and white footage of that era, which is stunning. We, had, we found this color. We had a great um, archivalist who found this archivist or whatever you say, found this color footage, which is rarely if ever used. And then we matched our close-up footage of our marchers into it so it could be feel as seamless as possible. You did a but, beautiful job. That was amazing. Yeah, well, all of that, you know, trying to make the um, archive material move. Sometimes it just can't, like the Houston Women's Conference, it's video. The stuff in the 60s is much better because they shot on film, much better. And the city streets in New York, that's all archival. We couldn't do any of that. You know, there, we shot everything. Now here's another ironic thing in Savannah, Georgia. <laughs> I mean, we are so connected to what's going on right now, but we shot everything. Maybe we had two days in New York um, because we shot Gloria's real apartment where you see her at the end up in the window. That is the real Gloria Steinem. And where she's sitting at the typewriter, that is Gloria's back. She said, oh, I'll do it. I'll, I'll be the extra in this scene. Um, I wanted people to feel confused, not confused, but the, the segue from Julianne Moore to the real Gloria is it, sort of a, Mm, you should be surprised when you see the real one on the bus, but still, that's the real one in the window. <laughs> what, when you, um, when you're talking about that, when you were talking about being on the train in India with the women, um, one of the things that really struck me about your film was you have four glorious, you have these iconic characters that you cast, the supporting roles. I mean, they're just, the, the, the actresses that you've cast are terrific. And then you have 150 speaking parts. I read some like of that. Your, your cast with people like Timothy Hutton and uh, Julianne Moore and the young actresses and Alicia Vikander, can you talk, and, and Bette Midler and Lorraine Tressant, can you talk about the casting process because uh, it really is, I love how everybody goes into their roles. They don't, they, they embody their roles as opposed to put the character on and strut it around. Well, I had to, I, I, I asked Julianne Moore first and she attached herself to the film before we had financing. And it was right around the Women's March uh, four years ago. So I knew she could play Gloria Steinem, but I, I, I knew she couldn't play Gloria Steinem under 40. So there was a real, I mean, even with, with uh, Frida, uh, Salma Hayek played Frida Kahlo from age 16 to 47, but she was in her mid thirties when she did it. And she, you know, she still is amazing with skin and all this and that, but you know, the haircut, the this and that, we didn't, and we used a little prosthetics for the 47 year old because she didn't, she didn't quite, get there. But with, I didn't want to do the Scorsese. I mean, we didn't have the money, are you kidding me, to do the uh, de-aging. And, and I thought that there was, because we also were going to have to have a child, Gloria. Mm -hmm. uh, originally it was just three. But if all us women know that a seven-year-old girl is not the same as a 12-year-old girl in not just physically, but mentally in any way, shape or form. So I had to split the young part of Gloria's life into two. Then it felt, okay, that's when the Glorias as a concept started to take shape. If I was going to tell 80 years of this incredible woman's life, I, I couldn't do it with one actor. So I split it up. And then of course we have the real Gloria at the end, but now that you've all seen it, it's okay to say that, but most people don't know that when they're going into the film. It's not in the trailer, we don't talk about it too much. But, uh, and then it was, it, you know, let me tell you the, the bus out of time, which I think is what I call the black and white sections of the Greyhound bus forever traveling on the road. That was the big aha light bulb moment as to how to tell the story. So in that, and I'm not answering you about all the casting, I'll get back to that. That was the glue. It was how do these four actresses interact with each other and why. And because part of this is the memory of things, you know, like the scene where uh, Alicia Vikander goes into the old age kind of nursing home for her mother after the Playboy Bunny article comes out and her mother's better, but you see that 
and she, it, you know, and then we cut to the bus where she says, um, I, I was afraid to ask my mother why she didn't just leave Pop and why didn't she just go to New York and become the writer that she wanted to become. And then Julianne Moore says, well, because she would have said if I had done that, I'd never have had you. You would never have been born. And Alicia Gloria says, yes, but you would have been born instead. She would have been born instead. Now that in the book was the first person narrative of Gloria Stein and thinking about it and not chastising herself, but, but you know, having this nagging longing feeling that something was incomplete about her relationship with her mother. That goes through, when you watch any of those conversations on the bus, those came from these moments where Gloria Steinem did reflect upon how guilty she felt about not being in the hospital for her father. So because that is not, I don't want to do uh, the classic voiceover, I should have blah, blah, blah with a voiceover. I didn't want Chirons either. You know, I didn't want 1965 Boston. You know, I was going to tell this story through the drama. And I felt that the interaction of the older and younger Glorias with each other, whether they were laughing, criticizing, sharing, or any of the emotions that happened on that bus was dramatic. And also would help go from one time period to another could be the, you know, the interstitial glue that would, and you would know that it was fantasy, not fantasy, that it was an, an inner reality because it was in black and white and timeless. They were always pretty much the same archi um, uh, archetypal age. You know, they pretty much stayed the same age. We didn't see, um, until the very near the end did I age, I had to age Julianne for the part that was much, much later, the last one before they, she goes to visit Wilma Mankillers, you know, as Wilma is dying. That one I needed because I needed to age her or you would be shocked if you saw her there in that uh, room. So as far as the other casting, the big ones, uh, right away, Bette Midler came to mind for Bella and, and Gloria was ecstatic about it. And I think she might've even called her for me. And, uh, and so that was done. And I've just gotten a letter from Liz um, Abzug, who, is, who wrote me and said that it was the best portrayal. It was perfect of her mother. Mm -hmm. And I said, did Harvey Firestein see it? Because he played, yes, he did. And he liked, he thought she was great. So, and then people like Janelle Monet to play Dorothy Pittman Hughes, even though it's not a big part. She, I had seen her at the Women's March. She's an activist. I knew that her politics and her feeling about women uh, that she was she would be great for the film and that she's a wonderful and she's a wonderful actress which we're we're learning more and more since I cast her 4 years ago we're we're beginning to see her blossom as an actress i knew Lorraine Toussaint and i knew she'd knock it out of the park which she did for um, Flo Kennedy and i auditioned both the women for um Dolores Huerta and Wilma Mankilla were auditions Oh. And I didn't know that these women were both activists when I auditioned them in their own communities. And I adore them, the two actresses. Uh, and let me see, who have I missed? The woman who played Ruth, the mother, she was in M. Butterfly on Broadway. So I'd already worked with her and I think she's spectacular. And Tim Hutton, I just took a chance on it. What's the chance? You know, he's a great actor. The young girls, the Lulu who plays the 12 year old, Lulu Wilson, she sent me a tape before I even started auditioning. She sent me a tape. What kind of agent or parent she has, I don't know. She was so damn good on that audition tape, I didn't even audition anybody else. She got the part right away. And Kira, uh, she, um, uh, she auditioned and that was a very difficult one to find. And I think she's, she's done, she has done a lot of acting, but she, she, um, she was tremendous. So those are the main, the main parts. And then you audition when I'm in Savannah, everybody else is by videotape you know, and there's a wall of hundreds of people and faces. And if they were local, they could come in and see me and audition, but they were local in that they were from Atlanta and various, you know, around Savannah. But I, I yeah, that was, well, that it's, was the, casting. the cast is, is tremendous. Um, I want to switch gears just for a moment. I want to ask you um, something more, I guess, uh, personal um, that I think is something that our audience would like to hear about, which is, I'm wondering if and how your Jewish identity informs who you are as a creative person. 
or, at, or at how, you know, if, if there's a way that you, how you move in the world, how you make your choices. I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. I don't know that I think about it that way. So it's very hard to say whether that is a real thing or not. My, my, um, you know, my instinct is that it is, it is important. I mean, not important that I have to identify that way, but that it, that it is a part of my DNA, that it's a part of my background. And that if you, you know, uh, Elliot Goldenthal, who is my other half for 35 years, he did the score to, to and he's from Brooklyn and um, he's Catholic and Jewish. So he's got guilt on every single side. But, you know, we, we were talking the other day because we're all very aware of this incredible insurrection that's happening and also the whole rise of Hitler and the Nazis. And we, we take in and look at all of that as much as we can, you know, and, and as, as a Jew, it really hurts us deeply to see the horrendous Jews in, high, in the high office of Trump you know, just like tremendous, or what's going on with Israel. So, you know, we, I'm sure that this will now get your audiences on both sides of the map, but I've been to Israel three times. We performed Juan Darien in Israel, our show, which was the Requiem Mass in Israel. We did that and, you know, Catholics are not, who thinks about Catholics? Israelis don't think about Catholics, unless they're Christians, you know, or Catholics, but, uh, but this, the, what is going on now, the kind of um, anti-Semitism on the rise, all of those have a lot of meaning to us. And I, I also, we were listening to Kurt Weill the other day and a lot of incredible 1930s music and Elliot just was looking, looking, he knows all of this, but all of the artists were Jewish in Germany, all of them. I mean, all of them, the composers, so many of them, I can't say all, but so many um, were, were incredible artists. And so there's this two sides of me, which is so proud of the great Jewish heritage, the writers, the artists, the leaders, the thinkers, the activists, the civil rights, uh, um, uh, Jewish young people who went down to the South, lost their lives, but all of that. Then there is the other side, which kills me, I have to say, and really is upsetting, you know, um, well, can I, I, mean, I could go deeper, but I, it, I can stand to antagonize some of the audience out there with some of that. But I, I feel that it is a very dangerous time right now. And I read Cast, which uh, if, if all of you have, have the opportunity to read Wilkerson's book, how she compares what went on in Nazi Germany and eugenics and all of that with the caste system in India and in America is an incredible book. And very worthwhile to read, and 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 I'm I think it's it's yeah. it's true, but it's also incredible of her to tell that story now of the Holocaust as well, or the anti-Semitism as having a, a relationship to you know caste everywhere. Well, I think what you really are just addressing is the importance of being human and 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 tapping into our humanism and asking questions. And not ask, Absolutely. and also being aware of your own history. I mean, yeah. and and the beauty of it, yeah. and the great artists and the great the great leaders and all of the wonderful parts of it. Um, yeah, I, so in that way, and of course, uh, Gloria was her father was Jewish, so we don't get into that because it wasn't a part of their lives. But she was very. It is a part of. I mean, his nature and his personality and his humor. This is one of the reasons her mother married her father was for that probably that kind of old Jewish humor. You know, I mean, she she he was as far away from her and her family, Ruth's family, as possible. And there is that kind of attraction that goes both ways. Well, th thank you for asking for answering um, a, a more personal question. Um, I'd like to ask you as a, so in your productions, whether it's opera, theater, film, you clearly enjoy embracing risk and finding new ways, fresh ways for audiences to enter the story world, to engage with the story world. And I'm just wondering, are there a couple of instances of like serendipitous moments on the production of The Glorias um, that you're particularly proud of or that were 
like surprising sort of aha, this is a perfect way to realize this. Um, Cause th there are many, many places in the film that I felt that. And I'm just wondering if there were, if you had a, a favorite. Well, there are these, um, how I would describe it is there's sort of three storytelling methods in the film. There's the normal dramatic actors acting out scenes in period clothing and places. And that's what we see mostly in movies, mostly. Then there is the archival where one had to make a choice. In Houston, we had a, in, in Savannah, we had this giant um, convention center, it was fantastic. And we had about 200 women, that's it. It's supposed to be 20,000. So we always knew we would have to do the multiplication. And when you see that kind of clear quality, obviously that's us doing our movie magic stuff. But I shot a lot more uh, in drama form than I used. I went back to the archival and that aha thing of uh, like the, the planks. When you see that, that Latina woman talk about children at the border and I, or the lesbian um, plank you know, of, of uh, choice and you, seeing the real people, it just was better. You know, there was no, there's no way that I could, or even like Phyllis Schlafly. I know that people saw Kate Blanchett play that, but Gloria says it's so not true, Mrs. America. I mean, she said it's so false and it's women at women and that really bothered me. So I, I chose to show, instead of putting, having these kind of divisive characters who were a part of it, but not a big part, you know, I mean, Gloria says she never even, she may have met Phyllis Schlafly once or in passing, but it, she wasn't, it wasn't like this major foe. So I had the real Phyllis. There's nothing stronger than the real Phyllis Schlafly and that horrendous senator who attacks these women. So I felt that was a different method and that needed, we needed the real footage. We needed the real place in Boston. That's real streets. You know, we, we were able to use visual effects to um, create that. The third part is the one that I'm getting to is more of the um, surreal, fantastical, again, like the bus, inner landscapes, dreams, um, projections, uh, thoughts. And they're, each one is different. In Frida, I did the paintings coming alive, like six or seven, but that had a you know constant, it was obvious. Those are her paintings. This is how she thought them. And you see the paintings coming together and the final painting, but I, I enact them out through surrealism, through animation mixed with CGI, mixed with not very much CGI, but you know, this kind of thing. Here, for instance, one of my favorites is uh, the 12 year old coming back from the barbershop when she looks at her neighborhood in East Toledo, this, you know, and, and that was a neighborhood in Savannah, a very poor black neighborhood in Savannah that probably wasn't exactly like the one that Gloria grew up in, but it was equivalent. And to see that transform into the idealized Hollywood with her hero, Fred Astaire, leaping off of a marquee onto the window of the bus, and I fuse the bus and the police car, this to me is why you make films. I mean, yeah, you can have actors acting out things, but you know, the other thing is to tell the inner life and how that, that music and the sound score and the colors, we worked really hard on that sequence. That took a lot of time to make the lights right, to have the black and white mixed with the golden and the kind of deco colors and all of that. So that's one, obviously running on the treadmill. That idea came because I didn't read more many of the other books till a lot later. And somewhere in one of her other books, she read that in her late forties or fifties, that, you know, was she, that's why you hear, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, that came to me, that's what a child says. Even Simba says it in The Lion King, are we there yet? Uh, but, but here where she described her life as being on a treadmill, I went, boom, visual. Now, you know, it begins, I like the beginning of that treadmill. And then you realize which direction is she going in and is anything changing? And look at us now, everybody sees it and they go, my God, we haven't changed that much. You know, we're going backwards with the, with the abortion issues. We're going backwards. So there are those. And then the biggest one that had the most controversy, and I'm sure many of you hated it, or maybe you all loved it, but is the um, tornado. Now, people would ask me, is that the way that Gloria thinks? And there's a certain point as an artist and as a, as a composer, a filmmaker, where 
That's not the point. You are creating your own vision of that person's life. And Gloria never told me that story. It's not like she sat there and said, when that guy asked me if, he, if I would uh, forgive him for being basically a, a sexist, she talked about his clothes, which I do, the tie that, you know, that's, she didn't say it that way, but you know, she did. But I felt as a woman, um, younger than Gloria, but having gone through many, many things in my young days and uh, even now doesn't change, uh, which is the, that there is an inner monologue. And I liken it to when Hillary Clinton was in the debate with Trump and he stalked her behind her, this jolly red giant was there um, looming over her shoulder. I wanted to see the inner monologue because she couldn't say what she was thinking. She said that later. I heard her recently in her document, in the documentary on her. If she said what she was thinking, it could go either way. What a bitch, what a, you know, the bitch witch syndrome, starting with uh, Macbeth, you know, I do, I do the Macbeth, I Wizard of Oz, I do also um, Harry Potter. It's all kind of conflated, you know? This idea of women who speak their minds in a serious way Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, she was called a bitch on the steps of Congress because she was straightforward. And you can imagine, I mean, the witch of Hillary, the witch of Nancy Pelosi, all of this, I, I played with this idea of the uniform because we have the bunny uniform. In Japan, a child, a, a, a little girl's school uniform is a huge part of pornography a huge part of it. So that little girl jumping onto that interviewer's lap and saying, what's a sex object? Uh, to me, no one ever talks about it, but that's one of my favorite moments in the film. And I, I wanted to play the, 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 with the tornado. It's not, it's not Haridans, it's humorous. It's, it's witty and ironic. Nothing happened. Three seconds pass, as you know, because you cut back to the, to the um, director and his assistant and what's she doing? Not answering him, you know, it's, and then she comes up with one line, which is forgive and forget. And that's the true Gloria, which is, okay, move on. You don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna manipulate that me or you're not gonna upset me that much. There's lots of you, I don't care. Let's go make Ms. Magazine. And this particular scene is very much there because it is, big transition from Alicia Vikander to Julianne Moore. And I needed to make it in a substantial thing where they shared the scene, yeah. you know, transition from, they wear the same clothes, same hair, same boots. Um, but now we move into this part of Gloria's life where she says, okay, I gotta make it happen. Not by myself, with my comrades, my other women, but I, I can't wait around for the editor or the publisher to say I can write this or write that. So there's many functions when I made that particular scene. And there are other ones that go through the movie like Kali, you know, I just looked at the cover of Ms. Magazine. It's one of my favorite things is the animation of, of that magazine cover because people take it for granted. That's the goddess Kali and she, you know, the Indian goddess and she's, you know, balancing babies in her belly and irons and telephones and clocks. And, and it was the woman who has to do everything. And I just thought, well, there's a good transition into the real Ms. Magazine. So I use high style animation, CGI, often also not just to tell you a scene in a different way, but as transitions to the next part of a life. And, and one of the things that I just, I love the animation scene. Um, I have to tell you the, the women's conference in Houston, the way you braid the archival with the dramatic, the, the reenactment is such a exhilarating pas de deux. It's, uh, there's many moments oh, when, 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 the, when the four, when the four Glorias are on the bus and her father's car is driving by and how you mm -hmm. capture the emotions. There's like, you really bring a great emotional depth not to, to living history because it's an, it's, this is a hero's, a heroine's journey. Yeah. And it's epic, it's 80 years and there's so many places. And I just, I really admire everything. Like you really, you're like Kali. You've pulled all these <laughs> elements in. It's really oh um, it's remarkable. <laughs> Um, I wanted to, we, our time is running out. So I wanted to ask you one final 
perhaps predictable question, um, which is at the end, I love that you end where you were going down the bus and we see the pink hats and we're oh, or going to the march and there's there's Gloria and then you cut to the footage of her speaking and she's so articulate and timely um, when she says sometimes pushing send is not enough. is not enough yeah and I'm wondering right now um, this screenings are scheduled uh, purposely around the inauguration. I'm just wondering, do you have any special takeaways that you really like, who would you especially like, what communities would you especially like this to see this film or any special takeaways? I just, um, it's not- well, it's hard. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were supposed to be uh, uh, in movie theaters and um, we have wonderful distributors, but they were not as keen about going on television right away, streaming. And, and we don't have any money to, to push it. So I wish we had ads on MSNBC because I think that audience is obviously a natural audience, but people don't know about it. You have to look for it. So I'm very pleased that, that uh, Roadside and the Jewish Film Festival were able to connect because we're not not yet getting the wide enough audience, I don't think. And and I think people just don't know. There's no, there's, you, who sees the trailer? You don't see it because there are no movie theaters. So that's been very frustrating for all of us, but we didn't want to wait a year for this film. We were, we were going to originally be on a bus together, Gloria, myself and the actresses and other people, activists moving through the swing states. Now, thank God, we didn't have to. I mean, thank God the results came out and, and Biden won by a landslide. Um, so I, but I would love, I, I don't, you know, I've been surprised that men like the film as much as women because it surprises them that they do. The obvious one is women who lived through it, but, and they, and they recognize it and feel happy that someone actually told the story. But I love having young men and women, young men and women. I don't think more women than men because, because men get surprised. How many times do men get to see a, a film about women that's not about sex, boyfriends, bad husbands, murders, you know? I mean, we don't have movies about women just living their lives together that, and, and loving to work together, like watching those women have a good time with each other. How many men get into the workplace of women? We women have been watching this forever, just like African-Americans have been watching white culture forever. So congratulations. We finally have a lot of great African-American filmmakers and movies out there now and women filmmakers. So I, I don't, I don't want to say just young women, although I think it's good for young women to see what their mothers and grandmothers had to do because you should, shouldn't take any of it for granted. I mean, they're going to lose the rights like today, yesterday, what happened with even getting the morning after pill. I mean, this is ridiculous, you know, okay, so you can't, aren't gonna be able to have an abortion, but you can't even prevent that point without doctors, which is very tough for young girls, it's going to be. Um, I also feel that the abortion part, which we didn't talk about, which is an extremely important part of the movie. Gloria Steinem dedicated her book to the doctor in London who said, promise me two things, that you will live your life, that you first, that you will not say my name, which she didn't until he died, and that you will basically live the life you want to fulfill your life. So that was, I thought that was brave. Oh my God, look who she dedicates it to. Not to her mother, not to, not to Bella, not to you know any of these people to the person who let her live her life fully because he approved of this, which was illegal then. So I, I think the scene with Dolores Huerta in Houston, now Dolores is a living icon as well, Dolores Huerta. She's the one who said, yes, we can, si se puede. And, 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 and Obama has acknowledged that he stole it from her, but people don't know that, but that was, she was the one. And she uh, was absolutely Catholic, had 12, I don't know, 10 or 12 kids. And, and came like we show to support the right to lifers. But she did this transformation in her life. And I, I came up with this idea that I needed to find someone that we respect, who is an activist, who was anti-abortion to see their 
coming to terms with choice. And this is very important to me. As Gloria says, no one's for an abortion. Everybody's anti-abortion. What we are is pro-choice. And the problem is that the, that the right to lifers, that's a great word, right to life. I believe in right to life. I am a complete right to lifer. And I think the words pro-choice is weak compared to right to life. They have the good words, steal, stop the steal. What a great line. Why didn't the uh, Democrats put out stop the steal? Why? I mean, they've got very, very good creative people in their um, titling, whatever, capacity. So this scene with Dolores and Gloria didn't happen exactly that way in Houston. And I called Gloria and I said, look, I, I wanna take what I know from the transformation of Dolores to saying maybe not for herself, but who is she and who is anybody to tell other women that they don't have the choice to make their lives what they need it to be, especially when you see how the government does not take care. They don't care, right? When the baby's born, who cares? Let them suffer, let them be in neighborhoods that have guns and drugs and let them, you know, whatever. The mother can't have a job, she can't fulfill her life, whatever. There's no help at that point, especially back then, but still now. Um, and I asked her, is it okay to write that scene and put it in this context? And she, I said, will you ask Dolores? And she did, she called Dolores and Dolores said, absolutely, okay. So that scene to me, you know, again, I haven't read everything, but people, people talk more about style than they do about the content of the movie. And I think there are a lot of gems from Gloria's life and from these women, all of them, including that the fact that African-American and women of color were in this movement from the beginning. And there is a true misconception about that. Sure, there were plenty, even in the right to vote for white women. I mean, the white women excluded to, in order to get it done, but I was just reading Jill Lepore's book, These Truths, mm -hmm. which is an extraordinary history. I just finished the Civil War, oh my God. I learned what that amendment with the third uh, article is before it happened yesterday. So I'm just sort of reeling from this. But the fact is Susan B. Anthony and, um, uh, what's her name, um, Stanton, uh, they were abolitionists and wrote a lot of this way before the, the next step in, in um, um, suffrage, you know, in trying to suffer. So there is, and you know, I, there is truth. The white women did, did cut the ties to black women or because they, they, they felt in order to get it done. But there is more history to these individuals and there is extraordinary history and those black women like Ida B. Wells and these incredible women. There are so many great stories. So part of me doing this film was not just about Gloria. That's why it's called the Glorias. It's not just the four or five, it's those women. It's, it's not saying I Spartacus, but in a way it's saying who is Gloria if there weren't Flo Kennedy? if there weren't Dorothy Pittman Hughes and Wilma Mankiller, her best friend. Why do I spend the death with Wilma? Because that is the woman who was more instrumental in her later life than anybody else. Mm -hmm. She, and, and Indian, uh, American Indian, indigenous concepts, the ideas of the circle, everything that you hear you know, throughout the film, these are really the things, like in that church, Father Egan, listening to her speak in the Catholic church about the circle. So, that, that, is, that is the real heart of this to me is all those women, not just Gloria, but all those women together make what a, an American woman is. Well, it, it does, it makes those words that end your film. Uh, it's not I the president, it's we the people. We the people. So yes. Julie, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you again. You um, too, you too. So, such a pleasure to speak with you about a really important and wonderful film. So um, is there a website or anything that you would want to direct people to uh, for the film or? I don't even know. I think you just have to look up the Glorias. Uh, obviously everybody's seen it and it's on Amazon Prime. And uh, I think it's on other platforms as well. Maybe Rota can tell you, but um, I, I think there is a website of the glory as the movie. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank everybody. Be well. Good stay talking. well. Okay. You too. Be well. And let's hope things are smooth or at least getting smooth. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.